ladies and gentlemen, a good, good evening and a very warm welcome to this evening's event at the Centre for Independent Studies. Could I just ask you to take a moment, please, to check that your mobile phone or smartphone device is switched to silent mode or vibrate mode. The, um, d the event this evening is being recorded, and so if you want to ask a question, you will be recorded and you, you, for posterity. So if you don't want to be recorded, if you don't want your image reproduced or your voice reproduced, say nothing. And it's a particular pleasure to welcome to our two speakers this evening, um, Andrew Lee and, and Tommy Tudorhope, who uh, are joining us to discuss politics and social media and to consider whether or not there is a new spin. Well, before he was elected as the federal member for Fraser in 2010, Andrew was a professor of economics at the Australian National University. He was educated at the University of Sydney and at Harvard and worked for a time as a lawyer and as an associate to former High Court Justice Michael Kirby. He was also principal advisor to the Australian Treasury. Andrew has written extensively on issues such as education, taxation and social policy and appears frequently in the columns of Australian newspapers. Tommy Tudhope is a prominent Australian social media expert after pioneering the use of social media and online activism in Australian politics with Malcolm Turnbull, he went on to work at Sky News and at social media advisory firm SR7. He now runs his own social media consultancy. Tommy has been widely published on issues such as online piracy, cyberbullying and media in the digital age. He appears on TV regularly as a commentator on a variety of issues, including social networking, politics, and the media, and makes regular contributions to opinion sites such as The Drum and The Punch. Well, the McKinsey Global Institute uh, published a report recently in which, speaking about companies, it said that failing to communicate with customers on social networks could be as damaging to companies as not answering phone calls or emails. I wonder if that applies as much to non-company organizations. Notwithstanding the plunge in the value of Facebook shares, social media applications such as Facebook and Twitter have had a significant impact on the way that information flows and that social relationships flourish or wither and that careers are built. What about its impact on politics? In a recent speech in Canberra, Andrew Lee thought that technological changes in media have actually led to greater inequality in political information than ever before. So, what's going on? Our two speakers will help us figure it out. Will you please welcome Andrew Lee and Tommy Tudhope. Well, we've uh, tossed a coin and it's been decided that uh, I would uh, open the batting. Uh, and let me say that uh, it's a real treat to be here tonight uh, speaking at the CIS uh, on the important challenges uh, that are afoot uh, in the digital age, thinking about how we react to a new media uh, and what we do. Uh, the CIS has been a great contributor to the, the big ideas debate in Australia. Um, I'd like to very much thank Greg not only for inviting me here tonight, but also uh, for all that you've done, Greg, over the years to contribute to a serious ideas debate in Australia. And I'd, of course, like to acknowledge at the outset that we're meeting uh, on traditional lands of the Indigenous owners and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. At the end of 1992, a team of us got together at Sydney University to run for the student newspaper on Iswar. We needed a name with a hint of journalistic credibility and a bucket load of electoral appeal. So we went for the name The Naked Truth. We threw ourselves into the campaign with the kind of frisky eagerness that only a dozen 20 year olds can muster. By day, we sang our Naked Truth campaign song to bemused lecture halls uh, by uh, removing parts of our clothing to reinforce the team name. Uh, by night, we put up posters and chalked the naked truth around campus, wishing as we did so that we'd chosen a shorter name. <laughs> a room full of medical students promised to vote for us on block uh, if a member of the team would streak naked through their lecture hall. One of us obliged. And so my year as a journalist began. I interviewed Andrew Denton, Henry Zepps, Dorothy McRae McMahon. 
I went inside Long Bay Jail and inside a submarine. Soaked to a magician, a monk, a basketball commentator, and wrote about biblical literalism and virtual reality machines. I even reviewed half a dozen sports cars, making me, I hope, the only motoring writer in the whole history of student journalism. And I loved journalism, but even at the level of student journalism, I found it hard. Uh, pitching stories, separating beef from bulldust, staying objective. Since I spent that year as a student journalist, I would have written hundreds of thousands of words in newspapers, uh, but all of them opinion, not journalism. And because of that, I approached the topic of journalism with a modicum of trepidation. Plus, because I'm a politician, you should probably regard my views on the media as akin to the views that a kangaroo has about gun ownership. <laughs> but the first thing to say is that journalism really can change the world. Emile Zola's Jacques Hughes letter did more than win Dreyfus's freedom. It changed fundamentally the political character of modern France. Reporting by the Courier Mail and the Four Corners program brought down the Bielke Peterson government, led to the jailing of three ministers. In 2005, a newspaper article brought down New South Wales opposition leader John Brogdon, and I think probably changed the outcome of the 2007 New South Wales election. Looking across the profession as a whole, I would happily put Australia's best journalists up against the best in the world. So what I'm going to argue today is not, for the most part, going to be about individuals. Sure, I wish there were more great journalists and fewer crummy ones. And I'm sure most journalists would say the same about my profession. But frankly, there's not much point in politicians and journalists engaging in a name-calling exercise. In Roy Morgan's latest poll, the share of Australians that rate either politicians or journalists as highly ethical or honest has fallen to one in ten. So we need to start thinking systematically. And as someone who's trained as an economist, that's my natural inclination. Human agency can be important, but pivotal changes are normally the result of technology and policy, not individual actions. People respond to incentives, so if you want better behaviour, then changing the incentives normally works better than moral exhortation. And the big technological shift underpinning everything we're speaking about today has been the falling cost of disseminating ideas. Cable, digital TV have expanded the number of channels. Digital radio is about to have the same impact on that medium. Ubiquitous broadband has allowed news to be conveyed through a host of electronic media. So the effect of this, economically, has been increased competition in the media market. And by international standards, the Australian media, particularly the Australian newspapers, have not been particularly competitive. So this technological change has come as a massive shock to the incumbent players in the Australian media market. One of the places you see the impact of competition is that contest between outlets to be first with a story. As they say, Treasurer Keating in the 1980s would spend a month doing his budget roadshow. When he first came into office, Treasurer Costello would take a fortnight. By the time he left office, he'd be taking a week, and that's about where the budget roadshow is today. So my central thesis, as Peter has uh, uh, flagged to you, is that technological changes in the media have led to greater inequality in political information than ever before. For engaged citizens, there's never been a better time to be a news consumer. You can watch your press conferences live on Sky and ABC 24, get transcripts of radio programs in different cities. You can access the opinions of thoughtful bloggers and sassy tweeters, as I'm sure you're doing even as I speak. Engaged citizens are now better informed about political news than at any other time in our history. But then there's the remainder of the population. Some who are 
too busy with family and community to bother with national politics. Others who are more interested in the views of Lara Bingle than Laura Tingle. Those who don't seek out political information, but let it come to them. And I believe that changes in the media are one of the factors that are making this group of Australians more disconnected from politics. In effect, technology has widened the information gap between the most informed and the least informed members of society. That notion, the one that technology can have a differential impact across society, is a pretty familiar one to economists. We use the term skill bias technological change to capture the notion that some technological innovations both help high skill workers and hurt low skill workers. So, for example, while computerisation was making lawyers more efficient, it was making their typists redundant. And the thing about skill bias technological change, about technology driving inequality, is if you're in the group that benefits, you can often not see the full picture. My guess is that many of you in the room are going to be engaged news consumers who most keenly feel the upside, the wealth of new information now at your fingertips. But it's important as policy makers and people involved in the policy debate to think about the whole impact across society if we want to get a full picture of how the media has changed people's views of politics. From the perspective of the most engaged citizens, the media is now more abundant, diverse and accessible than in the past. But that's not how things look to many Australians. Taken as a whole, the media has become more opinionated, narrower and shallower than ever before. Now that shift hasn't taken place because individual journalists have grown horn and forked tongues, but because the technological changes have privileged those kinds of voices. There's always been opinion, nastiness, shallowness in the Australian public debate. The thing is they've now flourished over recent decades due to the technology. So let's start with opinion. Most of the new political websites that have emerged over recent years, whether they're The Drum, Online Opinion, Australian Policy Online, are dominated by comment. On television, Sky and ABC24 thrive on commentary. Former Kevin Rudd Press Secretary Lachlan Harris puts it neatly when he says every year the number of journalists goes down, the number of commentators goes up. The economics of that is straightforward. As the environment becomes more competitive, you think about the fact that journalism costs money and comment is often free. And in the process, I think we're starting to devalue good reporting. Recently, Yale University journalism students were asked how they would have gone about investigating Watergate. And to, their sho to the shock of their guest speaker, Bob Woodward, they essentially said, most of them, that they would Google Nixon's secret fund and the answer would pop out. <laughs> now, looking to Australia, I must have read a hundred comment pieces on the politics and the polling of asylum seekers. But I don't remember a single journalist having asked a Malaysian government official, why haven't you signed the Refugee Convention? And again, this comes down to information inequality. The engaged news consumers see, see opinion as just adding to their smorgasbord. But disengaged news consumers are increasingly getting fewer facts and more commentary. Now, my concern about comment isn't primarily about ideological bias. Uh, I'm going to give you a revelation. I don't think the Labor Party is having a dream run in the mainstream press at the moment. Uh, but I know enough history to know that the worm turns. Uh, Curtin wins a landslide in 1943 with Packer and Murdoch against him. In the early 80s, Hawke has much of the mainstream media on his side. 2003, it's Howard Government Minister Richard Alston who files a dossier of 68 complaints against the ABC for perceived bias in their reporting of the Iraq War. Uh, so people, politicians of all stripes have uh, complained about the media. Uh, when I sat down with Joshua Gans to do our own systematic study of media slant in the period 96 to 2004, our answer was that most outlets had centrist positions. 
So my main concern about the rise of opinion is the risk that it leads to a more polarised electorate. A lovely experiment done by Stanford's Jeffrey Cohen asks students to rate a hypothetical social welfare program. And the students get an article that describes the program and which states whether Republican or Democratic leaders supported it. And the result is that what matters is not the welfare program itself, it's party leaders' views. So if their party endorsed it, Democrats would support a harsh welfare program. Republicans would support even a lavish one. My real fear here is that the rise of information threatens, of opinion, threatens the information commons. It threatens to split people into increasingly extreme echo chambers. The second trend that concerns me is nastiness. In her address to uh, another Sydney think tank last year, Annabel Crabb argued that there's a hostile, scratchy feel to politics at the moment. In the latest quarterly essay, Laura Tingle contends that Australia's politics and their public discourse have become noticeably angrier. Now, there's always been people saying ungenerous things about politicians. Uh, very often, those people are other politicians themselves. But there's two features of the technological shift that I think have accentuated the nastiness in political reporting. The first is competition from online outlets. The second is the shield of anonymity. And the impact of competition is to reduce the time outlets have to do their fact-checking. So when tabloid papers published on their front page fake nude photographs of Pauline Hanson, they did so partly out of a concern that if they didn't act in haste, then they'd be scooped by an online site. Competition from online outlets encourages outlets to exaggerate or simplify. When deadlines are tight, competition is fierce, you can see how journalists end up cutting corners. Uh, Oft-reported errors include the claim that opposition leader Tony Abbott's reaction to the death of an Australian soldier was, shit happens, whereas in fact Abbott was summarising another soldier's view or the oft-reported claim that Australia has an economy-wide carbon price, where in fact our carbon price covers about 60% of domestic emissions. Another way that technology accentuates nastiness is through the anonymity of website comments, blogs, tweets. And if you've ever said something nasty or on social media or over email, then you'd say in person, you know how it can happen. Even text messages provide a shield behind which poison darts can be heard, hurled. George Megalogenis uh, notes how 2GB's Alan Jones read out text messages before the Cronulla riots, such as this one. This Sunday, every Aussie in the Shire get down to North Cronulla to support Leb and Wog bashing day. As Megalogenis argues, the common sense filters that we use to keep the letters to the editor page civil prevent the cranks from getting on air, don't apply in cyberspace because the medium rewards those who generate the most outrage. There's even an academic study that found that individuals are more likely to be persuaded by political arguments that play on their fears, and that's true even when they're told counter-arguments. Again, this is a case of information inequality. If genteel discussion is your thing, You've now got instant access to every Productivity Commission report and thoughtful sites like The Conversation. But if you're a disengaged news consumer, then the public debate has become noticeably scratchier. My third concern is that the new media technologies are driving towards a shallower national conversation than in the past. One manifestation of this is the rise of the showman politician, known more for exaggerations and snappy grabs than their thoughtfulness. When I was waiting one day at the doors of Parliament House to speak to reporters, it occurred to me that the 24-7 news cycle has about the same effect as if we offered a cash prize every day to the politician who could come up with the most outrageous line. Another aspect of shallowness is the emphasis on gotcha questions. Will you rule out? Will it increase? Do you promise never to? And shallowness also manifests in picking examples that aren't representative of the broader context. The current inflation rate is 1.2%. It's the lowest in a decade. 
But you can always run a cost of living story by finding individual items whose price is rising, individual households whose costs have gone up. And similarly, the current unemployment rate of 5.2% is low compared to recent decades. But if you want to write about job losses, you'll always uh, be able to find examples. On the average working hour of the average working day, about 1,530 Australians lose their job, and about 1,550 Australians find a new one. Every working hour, every working day. Another feature of political journalism that's become increasingly ubiquitous is the focus on the horse race element of politics through the lens of opinion polls. As technology has reduced the cost of carrying out opinion polls, their frequencies increased. And the problem is that polls are notoriously inaccurate. Across major pollsters over the last two decades, the average election eve poll mispredicts the result of the election by 1.8 percentage points. Murray Goot notes the following. If an enterprising rogue had set up a pseudo poll that conducts no interviews but simply works on the assumption that at every election Labor would get 50% of the two-party preferred vote, he or she, she would have gotten an average error of, wait for it, 1.8 percentage points. And of course, if you're do doing polls earlier than election eve, your errors are lar larger still. Superficiality isn't something that's emerged in the last decade or so, but it does pose a particular challenge for reforms that aren't intuitive. The arguments in favour of free trade, foreign investment, a floating dollar, a goods and services tax and a price on carbon are all more subtle than the arguments against them. I think too for politicians the technological changes in the media have made reflection, doubt, subtlety more difficult than in the past. One of the major drivers of the move towards shallowness is the rise of television, the decline of newspapers. Television news bulletins tend to provide less depth than newspaper reports. So for the most engaged, the conversation might have become deeper and richer. But for disengaged citizens, the trend's been in the opposite direction. So what should we do about it? For the perspective of regulation, the Finkelstein report that the government's currently considering makes the point that when technology changes, legal regimes need to adapt. Take, for example, smh.com.au and msn.com.au, two of the most popular news websites in Australia. Content at the moment on the Sydney Morning Herald websites created by a newspaper which operates under a voluntary code of conduct regulated by the Australian Press Council. Content on the nine MSN websites largely created by a broadcaster with complaints directed to a statutory authority uh, which may consider the suitability of a person who, who seeks to hold a broadcasting licence. A newspaper proprietor, by contrast, is not subject to such a test. So I think if we were starting from scratch today, it's much more likely we would have come up with something like Finkelstein's proposed News Media Council than it is that we would have devised the current regime. But the, the argument I want to make is that complaints handling bodies are only a part of the challenge. And really, I, I think the more significant problem is sustaining the economics of quality journalism. One proposal that's been put forward both by Lindsay Tanner and Malcolm Turnbull is to provide subsidies to quality newspapers. Tanner proposes direct grants. Turnbull suggests providing tax-deductible gift recipient status to newspapers that subscribe to a code of conduct analogous, perhaps, to that subscribed to by the ABC. Now, naturally, I'm sure as Malcolm himself would say, such a proposal would have to pass a cost-benefit test. But you can imagine that uh, the, the benefit of a better informed public might well justify the subsidies. And I think in implementing such a proposal, it would be important to make sure uh, that public money increased the amount of political information available to those who are disengaged from politics. If you accept my thesis that the problem is information inequality, then we don't want to start subsidising content consumed only by those who are the most engaged. As an economist, I'm naturally drawn to using price signals rather than regulation to achieve a given aim. It's particularly the case where there's considerable controversy over 
defining what we mean by quality journalism. I don't think we can define good journalism any more than you can legislate good taste. Uh, sorry, legislate good journalism any more than you can legislate good taste. But appropriate subsidies might be able to get us there. And lastly, there's the question as to how reforming politicians should behave in a changing media environment. I don't think the changes afoot are ideological neutral, ideologically neutral. I do think that they're particularly beneficial for populists and libertarians. I think they're particularly confronting for long-game reformers. And in this, I'd include some of the reforms championed by the CIS over many years, including civility, teacher quality, tax reform, and Indigenous affairs. I haven't always agreed with the position the CIS has taken, but I do realise that you here at the CIS are more concerned with engaging in the battle of big ideas than thinking up the next snappy one-liner or demonising your opponents. A decade ago, when I uh, came to ask Greg's advice on setting up a left-wing think tank, uh, one of those projects that never came to pass, uh, he was generous with his time and his advice. You're here tonight because you're interested in big ideas. So for those of us who believe in big picture reform, it's vital we continue to talk about big ideas. Critical reforms like Medicare, universal superannuation, Hex, and the GST didn't happen by themselves. They were the product of passionate and painstaking advocacy. And I think we need to get better at linking the reforms of today with the events of the past. Too much reliance on talking points and lines can win the battle but lose the war. Humans are fundamentally storytelling creatures and stories are a powerful way of persuading people about the importance of change. Reform isn't about uprooting our history, it's about allowing our values to endure in a changing world. Reform to me is about identifying those golden threads that run through our history. So I've said a, a lot tonight that's pessimistic, but I think there's good reasons to be optimistic. We can't return to those old ways of doing things. We all need to learn to manoeuvre our way in the new environment. The fourth estate's going through perhaps the biggest transformation of the past century. For highly engaged consumers, there's never been a better time to be a news junkie. And here's hoping we can eventually say the same for the rest of the population. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. It's uh, good to be here and to uh, follow Andrew. Uh, I might take a slightly different approach to what Andrew's taken uh, and guide you through a, a journey of how politicians are using social media, uh, what it means for election results, uh, and how it reflects on the voting public and what they do online. Now, despite our current obsession with media appearances, big headlines, focus groups, political spin, is certainly not a new phenomenon. Radio, television, print, and more recently social media have all amplified the process of spin. More participants, more content, and more often. But are we better off or better informed? If anything, social media has given seasoned observers more material but less quality, more tweets but less ideas, and more commentary with less personality. Social media has put political chatter on steroids. It's simply inescapable. Watching the plethora of political shows now on offer, you will see tweets run across the bottom of screens, hosts plug their TV shows before, during and after like someone like Peter Van Onselen, Facebook pages plugging TV shows, or YouTube contributions in the middle of shows, all dedicated to discussion before, after and during an event. As I said, it is completely inescapable. Social media occupies an omnipresent part of our political discourse. Everyone is doing it, but not everybody is doing it right, and in fact, present company excluded, politicians are probably doing it the worst. The arrival of new technologies and new mediums of communications wrongly lure our politicians into a sense of a light bulb moment. For them, they think this new communication, this new technology, is a way of communicating to the masses who are less informed or less adequately able to communicate on such a platform. It's another, it's another medium or another mechanism to broadcast their focus group tested, poll driven and politically massaged mes message to the many. Now, it's, this is 
something that both sides are, are very much guilty of and you know even my time as an advisor I, I couldn't overcome now political spin may well be the case for TV print and radio but social media is a whole new beast altogether sites like Facebook and Twitter and blogs have little or no safety net no filter and very little recourse as I myself discovered when something goes wrong social media for me is not a new form of spin politicians may try to use online tools to spin a message of self-promotion or promote their later soundbite but spin requires more than the spinner it requires at the very least a potentially receptive audience Facebook and Twitter provide that audience but they are easily, not easily identifiable or accessible social media is not a new form of spin because politicians have suddenly become more honest or transparent social media is spin free because the participants own the medium they can tune in and out as they see fit and freely self-select what information they choose to digest and when they digest it. Now, some politicians and media personalities have bigger followings and more influence like Annabelle Crabb or Laurie Oakes or Kevin Rudd, but that doesn't mean they are more influential in terms of their substance or their content. The most influential factor overriding politics on social media is authenticity. Unlike door knocking or street walking or a community meeting, Politicians who are online are seeking to reach and engage with an audience on their terms. Now, most people who access Facebook and Twitter and other sites like that do so in their own personal time, on their mobile phone, their iPad, in their home, on their bus, walking to and from work or on their lunch break. Now, for a politician to penetrate that personal conversation at that point in time takes a very effective and very salient message. Now, a simplified broadcast message just won't have that sort of cut through. Now, despite the popularity of sites like Facebook and Twitter, you have um, over 11 million Facebook accounts in Australia and 4 million Twitter accounts, it's not for everybody. Now, during my time as a coalition advisor for too many years, uh, I spent a lot of time talking to MPs and senators about social media and what it meant for the election cycle. Now, most of these conversations were littered with comments like, this isn't for me, I, I can't do this, I don't want to do this, no one knows that no one wants to know when I'm brushing my teeth or when I'm having lunch and those concerns are entirely warranted and in fact my advice still remains to politicians if you're not comfortable doing social media don't do it you know it's far you're far better off having no presence at all than having a presence that is half-hearted and just going to be filled with scripted messages now one such politician who was not comfortable with social media was the uh, former Prime Minister John Howard his YouTube appearances in the lead up to the 2007 election were too little too late, too wooden and far too scripted. And only just this year he said when talking about his book Lazarus Rising that he himself would not have used Facebook. He thought it was a step too far. Now this probably says more about him than it does about the medium. Most Australian politicians now have a Facebook page, a Twitter account, a website, email newsletters, Facebook pages and employ tools like Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest. Or, like Malcolm, my former employer, uh, employ things like dog blogs. Now, most people when I talk about Malcolm's dog blogs uh, scoff or laugh, but in fact this is the perfect example of what online politics is. It's a intuitive and conversational form of message that spoke directly to his local audience in a political manner. It was underhanded and it started and generated conversations. Wentworth has more dogs than people, so it would fit perfectly with the local politics. Now, is this good politics or good spin? It's probably a combination of both. But few, if any, social media, sorry, few if any politicians use social media effectively. Obviously, some like Malcolm, Labor's Ed Husick, and even Rob Oakeshott sincerely use the medium to reach out to constituents and interested parties, communicate freely, and genuinely engage in forms of open dialogue. However, the vast majority of politicians simply use the medium to post pre-approved and scripted messages. Now, one clear example of this is Tony Abbott's budget and reply. Almost as soon as it happened and directly after, it was Twitter was flooded with Labor MPs tweeting the, tweeting the exact the same message. Now, the coalition does the same thing. Now, I think most people realise it's completely scripted and I don't know why they bother doing it. It has no little or no influence on... Uh, the wider community or even journalists who might be t listening into what they have to say. I think for too, o too often, polit for politicians, social media is the digitised soundbite. Same message, same tone, same motivation, just a simply different medium. 
this isn't spin, it's just an electronic billboard. But social media isn't a billboard, it's more of a town hall. Now some commentators, I won't name names or we can just call them Alan Jones and Ray Hadley, <laughs> like to think that Facebook is simply the domain of overzealous teenagers, gamers, nerds, celebrities, journalists or teens looking to flog a story or tweet about completely inane things. Now this is, couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, Facebook's most popular demographic is women, and women aged between 35 and 50. It's not teens or gamers or young people. And in fact, Facebook itself predicts that over the next 12 months, users over 45 will outnumber users who are below 45. Now, this has a dramatic influence on the way we've been communicating. So, as so social media and sites like Facebook are the new town hall, Historically, where people would have conversed for their book clubs or their sporting clubs or their political organisations in person and infrequently, they're now migrating online to places that suit them and able to communicate in a time that suits them. Now, whether most people started to use Facebook to keep in touch, most of their usage is now centred around news, current affairs and things that interest them in their day-to-day -day life. Now, this has an enormous impact on the way in which politicians can seek to engage these users and influence them on a political message. But is this online town hall advancing a more open style of political discussion? Personally, I think social media in its current application adds little or nothing to our political debate. Sure, it puts politicians a lot closer to the public, fosters more scrutiny and greater accessibility, but it's hard to discern just how this enhances or improves a policy-centric discussion. Distilling a discussion to a series of tweets, a YouTube video, or something like Julia Gillard's recent online hangout does not make the community more informed or improve the public's understanding of a policy position. Now, I'm wholeheartedly in favour of politicians using sites like Facebook to communicate who they are or what they believe in or what motivates them and what their policies mean to the public. And there is certainly an immense appetite for this type of information that is divorced from conventional scripted remarks that are made on TV and radio. But sadly, our political appear, elite appear too risk adverse to engage in these sort of political and personal discussions online. Now, there is an avenue to discuss policy on sites like Twitter and Facebook. It can be achieved through promoting ideas, posting discussion papers, reaching out to credible leaders, industry heads, initiating blog discussions, creating websites, Facebook pages. There's a myriad of options available. As Joe Hockey discovered in prior to the 2009 Leadership Challenge, when he tweeted, Hey team, R-E-E-T-S, give me your views please on the policy and political debate. I really want your feedback. Social media is not asking people about what they think one way or the other on a matter of policy. It is much more than that. The answers are already there. They're readily available. But to obtain them, a politician must immerse himself or herself in the conversation on a frequent basis and in a sincere manner. Sadly, most politicians and their respective parties fail to use social media in a way that would advance their own brand or their own policy position. Australian politicians and their parties and even political activists and the media lag well behind their international counterparts in the adoption and deployment of online tools. Now naturally, there are different forces at play here than there are in places like the US and the UK. But for, personally, I think Australian politicians lag for three key reasons. One, they don't understand the medium or the tools. Two, they think social media is simply another avenue to broadcast a message. And three, the message is too scripted and too predictable. Australian politics online has been all broadcast and no engagement. But why is this? In many, reflect, in many senses, it reflects a deep misunderstanding about the medium itself. It is much about listening as it is about conversing. Now, recently, David Cameron's online advisor, uh, was here in Australia and he had some very choice words to say to Australian politicians just about listening online. And he said, you can listen to people's conversations, you can understand what people are saying on public forums and informs what you talk about as a government because ultimately one common refrain against government is that things you are talking about aren't relevant. And there's a big distance between what I care about and what you're obsessed with. Using some of these anal anal analytical tools to understand what people are talking about is a really valuable because it helps you understand the issues that people are focused on. In the US, Republicans and Democrats are about five to ten years in front of their Australian counterparts. Their party organisations are using online tools to gain vast amount of personal data to target like-minded individuals and to predict voter intentions. 
it's an extremely effective way of doing things and to the p proponents that do it the best it's an extreme advantage. In 2008 Barack Obama raised over a billion dollars online through small donations and built an enormous trove of personal data that may well prove the difference in the elections later this year. And although US politicians dedicate a lot more time and effort to getting out their vote, their online endeavours continue to be more natural, savvier and far more targeted. Bland updates like we see here from Australian politicians just don't cut it online. In America, social media airtime is now becoming as unpopular as traditional media airtime. And there's no different in the UK. The political parties in the UK seem to be far more ingrained in the way they use social media. Here, unfortunately, there is too much resistance from party organisations, whereas the culture over there is how can we do this better? Or how can we adopt these tools in a way that is more cost effective to reach a bigger audience? The international disparity between the US, the UK and here can be attributed to a number of factors. Sure, we're a little bit more apathetic than our friends in the US and the UK, but there are far more tectonic forces at play here. In Australia, we're still awaiting a watershed online movement or a watershed online event. An event where, or an election where, both party leaders and candidates openly use online tools as an integral means of electioneering. An election where online campaigning is not seen as a gimmick by the media, but valued as a legitimate mechanism for genuine voter dialogue. Now the Kevin 07 election dismantled some of this thinking, but the Kevin 07 online campaign was simply a complement to the existing message, hey look at me, I'm the same but I can do things differently. Just a cursory look at the way Julia Gillard and Tony Abbott use social media will demonstrate just how far we are behind our online counterparts. Julia Gillard's Twitter account with over two and a half 250,000 followers is full of scripted and impersonal marks, too infrequent and no engagement with the average user. Tony Abbott's account with 70,000 followers is only marginally better. The updates are overly banned and infrequent. The only saving grace for Tony Abbott is his Ask Tony question time, which is, although very scripted in itself, a clear way of communicating with the public. Now, despite my love of social media, uh, online politics isn't the be-all and end-all of modern political discourse. It's just simply another means of reaching out and engaging with the community. If anything, social media should complement the existing message rather than supplanting it with a hipper or more youthful one. But regrettably, most politicians believe social media is an avenue for large-scale dissemination. Sure, their tweets may generate some action or reaction from an audience, but this is just purely cosmetic. It doesn't generate a, a wider or deeper or more lasting relationship with an individual that can be tracked and exploited for voting purposes. In a domestic context, social media has reduced political discussions to cheap chatter, quick wins and baseless personal jibes. If you thought question time was bad, have a look at Twitter, it's far worse. And to this end, I think it's, we've reached a point where it's now almost impossible for politicians and political parties to use a tool like Twitter for political conversion. The conversations are too perfunctory, lack any real meaning, and are too often met with scorn and abuse. Now that may change, but doesn't look like doing so anytime soon. As Andrew eloquently put before, social media is having a dramatic impact on the way in, in which politics is being reported, and it's often, I think, a little bit underappreciated by the wider community. Now obviously I won't canvas the issues in the way Andrew did, but it's certainly a penetrating glimpse of the obvious to suggest that online tools are having a vast and enormous influence on the way in which media is consumed. Journalists, commentators and media outlets all now routinely use social media to build an audience, to find an audience and develop relationships with their readership. The average reader is far more powerful than they were a decade ago. They can, can freely consume news online, pick and choose the sites that, and journalists they like and easily navigate away from websites that are not appealing, timely or engaging. Now to a degree, online sites and social media may be making our politics a little bit more partisan than it has traditionally been. Needless to say, social media is having an enormous influence on the way in which politics is being reported. Firstly, I think it provides far more insight than we traditionally would have got. For example, a story that was not substantive enough to gain traction for a mainstream newspaper article or a radio bulletin or a TV bulletin would for the most part remain within the confines of a newsroom. But now, through Twitter and Facebook, journalists have the opportunity to communicate that story 
in short tidbits to, the, to a massive audience. And I think this adds considerable value to informing the way in which politics happens on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think you only have to look at the way leadership spills are covered to see that the amount of minute information that is shared between, in between major events to see how much value this adds. Also, I think it gives far more influence to the individual. Now, some journalists are very, very effective at trawling through online sites to gain information for stories. Other journalists are less effective at doing this. But good journalists know where to find these potential stories and how to best exploit the online environment to generate news. And as a listening tool, I think Twitter and other sites provides journalists with inf interesting information and real-time reaction. Now, Wayne Swan's budget early this year provided an interesting example of that when he didn't mention his speech, but in the budget papers there was a, a small levy on piggeries or pig slaughters or something like that. And obviously it didn't get picked up by the mainstream media, but Twitter was all the buzz about a bacon tax. Now, this normally wouldn't have got reported, but the amount of traffic it generated online resulted in the next day Julie Gillard being asked a lot of questions about the so-called bacon tax. Now, it's, it is slightly humorous, but an individual action online does have an influence on offline or traditional media reporting. And finally, I think social media eliminates the filter between reporters and their audience or their readership. Now, letters to the editor still remain popular, but Twitter has allowed the audience to directly reach a majority of journalists at any given time and give them direct feedback, as harsh as that may be. Now, of course, at times it may be too harsh, um, but I think the ability for journalists to be reached by their audience instantaneously and immediately, I think, is a good thing and it keeps them honest. And we probably have, haven't, probably haven't been kept as honest as they should have in the past. Politicians and average voters and journalists aren't the only ones who have been using social media on the political landscape. In fact, much of the activity that has been generated online has been done by left of centre activist groups and most of the techniques used by major parties and politicians have been pioneered by activists. And I think personally, without doubt, the best ex exponents of online tools and social media to generate change are these left of centre groups. They are easily the most effective Get Up, Greenpeace, the unusual alliance between farmers and environmentalists over recent CSG moves, gay marriage activists and perhaps even people like the Occupy Wall Street movement are the most influential community organisers online. They generate the most traffic, the most followers and have the ability to translate online action to offline activity. Now this ranges from petitions to trolling, generating awareness, exposing large corporations, seeking media influence, but without doubt, activists are making the most of the online landscape. Sure, they have more time and resources, but their success goes well beyond that. They have quickly recognised that the barriers to participation are so low that new users can quickly be co-opted to a cause with just a simple click. Now, digital activism is not simply about generating traffic on a website or a Facebook page. It's the ability to translate online activity to offline action and ultimately political change. And until politicians and political parties realise this is the end game, they will continue to struggle in terms of online influence. And in Australia, I don't think we've actually seen a major political movement from an activist group, a politician or a political party do anything like what we've seen in, you know, overseas. I think the David Hicks email campaign in 2007 was very effective. Um, the anti-ETS campaign um, against Malcolm Turnbull's leadership was very effective. Um, some of the stuff we're seeing at the moment about marriage equality is effective, but it pales in comparison to what we've seen overseas in terms of actually getting changed to online movements. Now, one final topic that I'd briefly like to canvas and one that uh, Andrew touched upon is the increasingly pervasive culture of nastiness that has taken hold online and especially around conversations that focus on, on politics and the media. From Yumi Signs to Carl Sandlands, Bob Catter, uh, journalists, even less known people like Miranda Devine or even Melinda tankard Reist, the abuse is as constant as it is offensive. Now why is it that the bully boy mob now occupies so much time and so much influence online? Sure, anonymity plays a role, but it's very, at its very core, the lack of recourse and personal responsibility is fueling a wave of negative online insults. A tweet here, a post there, a comment here, who cares what I say regardless of how offensive it may be? But in truth, this sort of online commentary is degrading our political discourse. If social media is so ingratiated in our political landscape, 
how can politicians and the average member of the public freely participate without fear of hostile abuse and scorn? Twitter in particular has ceased to become a tool of conversion. And it's very difficult political parties and politicians to use Twitter as a tool to preach, converse and convert average users. Around every corner, an anonymous bully is ready to hurl abuse no matter how big, small, significant or insignificant the target is. Worse still, the abuse is often highly vitriolic or highly sarcastic. The vitriolic comments are usually promoted by fierce disagreement with a lack of common courtesy. I don't know them personally, so who cares how nasty I am. But the sarcastic comments are far more sinister. A highly targeted and well-timed sarcastic remark can immediately neutralise an online conversation. On Twitter, it can distract the target and cause them to question the content of their original message. And this is extremely pertinent for a politician or a journalist. And on Facebook, it can immediately devalue a conversation and prevent other users from participating. Now, before I conclude, uh, I might just make a few brief predictions on where I think the online political movement will go in Australia over the next five to ten years. Firstly, I think the coalition will be very wary about a return of Kevin Rudd to the leadership and what that will mean for online sentiment. In the most recent leadership challenge with um, Julia Gillard, Kevin Rudd easily won the online war. He's, uh, although Julia Gillard has more Facebook followers, Kevin Rudd's online followership is far more significant than Julia Gillard's. And the sentiment that he elicited from the user base was far more genuine, far more lasting and generated far more traffic than um, Julia Gillard does. And I think although I'm not involved intimately anymore, I think coalition observers would have been watching that very closely, just how positive the online sentiment was towards Kevin Rudd and his ability to manipulate those users or you know, coerce or convince those users about his cause. And I think that's a certainly a space to watch. And I think in its current environment, the coalition would rather be on par with Labor, even if Julia Gillard and Tony Abbott both can't use the medium. I think they'd much prefer that circumstance than one where Tony Abbott is significantly behind Kevin Rudd in his use of online tools. Uh, the second thing is that with the change in election funding rules, at least here in New South Wales, I think we're about to see an explosion in micro donations. Um, I think predominantly now the corporate dollar goes 50-50 to both major parties. Obviously the Labor Party get more money from unions, but slowly we're seeing a migration towards smaller donations. And if political parties and politicians can fully understand how this can be done and what's been done in the US, uh, the, p the party that does this better and sooner will, will gain a significant advantage and it's a huge untapped market. Uh, and the third thing is I think Facebook will kill off Google. Now, this is not so much a political uh, observation but one more about social media and technology. The influence of a friend's recommendation to a friend is far more powerful than one that is developed or powered by an algorithm. Now, although Facebook shares are sort of tanking at the moment, its ability to understand friendship connections and friendship networks is far more powerful than Google's system of a algorithm-based search. So, uh, personally, I think the way in which social media and the online tools are merging towards or navigating towards is a system where networks and friendships are, are purely based on um, personal connections. Now, just to conclude, um, Probably the, the grandfather of the online political movement was a guy by the name of Joe Trippi who pioneered email marketing with uh, Howard Dean. And he said uh, in his book that the revolution will not be televised. And I think he's 100% right. From Egypt to Syria, to the live tweeting of Bin Laden's death, to politicians writing about their dogs, media magnets commenting on the poor taste of British food, social media has dramatically changed in the way we converse. And social media is here to stay and will continue to occupy more people, more time, and consume more of our political discussions. Now, without doubt, some conversations debase and devalue the tone of a meaningful dialogue. But any medium that promotes greater access, more transparency, and more sincere form of engagement between the elected and the electors should be encouraged. For their part, politicians will attempt to spin, massage, and manipulate any medium at their disposal. That's nothing new. But unfortunately for them, social media channels are somewhat immune to outright spin. As the next generation of voters grow older and become more political aware, just as generations before did, will they be turning to talkback radio or newspapers to inform them? Probably not. 
they will be turning on their masses to social media. And in fact, the online fo their online footprint will determine the reputation and esteem of the next generation of politicians. Let's just hope they do it with some sincerity, some personality and some values. Look forward to your questions. <laughs>